Hi, I'm Dr. Laura Wilson, the Curator of Paleontology here at the Sternberg Museum of Natural History, and thank you for joining us for a new way to museum. Today I'm going to be talking about paleontology. So I'm a paleontologist, and one of the questions, I get lots of questions, is what is paleontology? How do we study it, and what can we do with it? So paleontology is simply the study of ancient life. So we study extinct organisms. There are a variety of different organisms, pretty much everything that's been living on, um, on Earth and Earth's past are game for studying. Some of the, the three main branches of paleontology are things like paleobotany, which is the study of plants. So it can be everything from studying fossil wood. Um, we have some beautiful examples here of some polished fossil wood where you can actually still see some of the, the cell structure in them or, or some of the tree rings. Um, as well as fossil leaves, you can see the imprints, the shapes of the leaves, the veins of the leaves. Um, people can also study pollen. Pollen fossilizes very well and is a very important branch of paleontology. Then the two other branches gets, rather than plants, are the study of animals. So we have invertebrate and vertebrate paleontology. So invertebrate paleontology is the study of animals that lack backbones. So things like clams and snails, um, ammonites, which are other mollusks related to clams and snails, uh, somewhat related to the chambered nautilus that's still alive today arthropods like insects or crustaceans, as well as trilobites, which are very famous and frequent fossils. Um, pretty cute when they, when they enroll as well. Things like bryozoans or corals that actually look a little bit more like plants, but are living animals. Um, and then some of my favorite, the echinoderms. These include things like a starfish or a sea urchin, as well as this, which is a stemless crinoid. They're also called sea lilies. They look like a plant, but they are an animal. Um, and I always think it's very interesting that crinoids, so a starfish, is actually the group of invertebrates, a, an animal lacking bones, is the closest relative to vertebrates, which are animals that have bones. So there's no doubt, especially saying this as a vertebrate paleontologist, so yes, I am biased, but vertebrate paleontology definitely gets a lot of the attention because we have the big animals with big teeth um, that, that make, it into, make it into the movies, into pop culture. So when we're studying vertebrate paleontology, we're studying animals that have bones or cartilage skeletons as well as teeth. So everything from fish, including sharks, to lizards, to um, turtles, to birds, as well as mammals. These are all vertebrate animals. And so these are just the many different branches of paleontology that, that people can specialize in. But there are a lot of things when we start getting into what paleontologists study. There are a lot of different things that we can help understand with um, studying ancient animals, fossil animals. So one of the things that we study is their anatomy. So how their skeletons are put together. So we look at how the different bones are attached to each other or how different parts of the, the shells or the exoskeletons are put together to figure out what they looked like, how big they got. Um, this also helps us figure out how they lived their lives. Um, so a field that we call functional, functional morphology. So how the shape and the size and the way their body is put together, how that relates to how that animal moved and functioned, how it fed, whether it walked, whether it swam, whether it, um, whether it flew, and things like that. So we can also uh, then take the, the information that we know from how an animal's body or a plant's skeleton, a plant's body is put together to understand how different organisms are related to each other. So the, the fancy word for this is phylogeny. So understanding who is related to whom and how we know that, what characteristics different organisms have in, um, in common or have different from each other. This then helps us understand how evolution takes place, what changes when, um, and how we transition from one species to another. We can also understand how an animal grew, so from when it's born or when it hatches all the way through adulthood. So we can look at things like our, um, 
our uh, fossil rhinoceros down here. This is a rhinoceros called Teleoceros. It's from Kansas. And you can see here they have these big um, uh, uh, tusks on the, in their lower jaw. And this one is actually still embedded in the bone. So this one hasn't erupted yet. And so we know that this is a juvenile that is actually going to poke outside of the jawbone and outside of the gum line as, it, as the animal gets older. We can also look at the shape of the size and figure out what animals ate. And this helps us get at ecology, so how um, organisms uh, interact with each other and their environment. So we can look at things like a mammoth tooth, and you see that flat grinding surface. And we know that that animal was eating grasses, and it used this washboard-like surface to grind really tough, silica-rich grasses back and forth. Or we can look at something like our fossil gar here. And if you look at this, this is one of my favorite specimens, is it looks a little weird up near the mouth region. And that's because this gar choked on another fish while eating it. So this is the gar's tail. And then this is the tail of whatever it was attempting to eat and was not successful. So sometimes we actually get evidence um, of gut contents or a failed ingestion of a food item uh, that, that can give us hints as to who was eating whom. Another one of my favorites is this mosasaurus. So this is a big marine reptile. Um, and this is called globidens. And so this doesn't look like our typical mosasaur with big scary teeth that was pretty much eating anything that got in its way. This has these kind of rounded mushroom shaped teeth on it which were specially adapted to crushing hard things, so like a clamshell, um, which we have in abundance throughout the, the seaway where this lived. Um, so we can kind of put together the keys through the bones, through the teeth, through the shell, to figure out how these animals were living their lives, what they were eating, how they moved, who's related to whom, what age they are, and all of this cool pieces of information that you know, you might not realize that we can actually get by studying fossils. In addition to looking at the fossils themselves, we do a lot of comparisons to modern animals or modern ecosystems. So especially for animals so like a sea turtle that we have ext extinct sea turtles from hundreds of millions of years ago, and then we still have some sea turtles that are alive today. We can look at how they moved, how they grew, um, what they ate, how their body relates to how they were living their lives to better understand what happened um, or what extinct organisms were doing. Another question that I get a lot of is what people can do with paleontology. So if you go to school, study paleontology, get degrees or whatnot, what, what jobs are there available? Um, and really it depends on what interests you and how far you want to go in school. So if you go all the way through PhD um, to become a, a doctor or you go through the, the doctorate program, um, typically people go into a university or a museum and they're teaching, they're doing research, they're taking care of fossils um, and things like that. They're working with students and training students. And, but museums employ a lot of paleontologists at all different levels, and that's people who work up through volunteer programs to people with bachelors, masters, and PhDs. So it could be a curator, which typically is somebody who's doing research as part of their, their job description. Collections manager, so somebody who is taking care of the fossils within a collection and making sure that they're preserved and all of their data are preserved and archived, helping people study them, things like that. Uh, the fossil prep lab or research lab managers, so people who are assisting with the research or the education process. Um, people in uh, museum education and outreach programs, uh, having a background in paleontology is very common. We actually have two paleontologists on our education team here at the Sternberg Museum. Um, and kind of all over the, the museum. Um, another place that a lot of paleontologists are employed is through consulting, especially uh, if um, you know, oil and gas companies are going into public land to either drill new wells or lay down well pads or roads or something like that. There have to be surveys. And so there are a lot of different and diverse jobs for people coming into paleontology um, and are interested in building on that as a career. 
So the job market might not be huge, but there are a lot of interesting things to do, and it's actually growing, especially with things like science communication is a huge growing field right now. And I think paleontology is actually doing a really good job with, with science communication because we have really cool things to talk about um, with, the, with the general public. And so we see a lot more paleontologists getting into science writing, science communication, PR and marketing, and things like that to help spread scientific information um, to, to everyone so it can be enjoyed by everyone and understood by everyone. Um, and that's really where the importance of paleontology comes in, is really to excite people about science and the scientific project process, to educate people about how science works and what it's important. Um, and we can do that with really cool things like big dinosaurs or big marine reptiles or, or really cool, really cool um, uh, ammonites and stemless crinoids and stuff like that. So thank you for joining us today as we kind of go over the, the basics of what paleontology is and how, we can, and how we do it. And if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments and we'll come by and answer them. Thank you. Thanks for joining us in the New Way to Museum with the Sternberg Museum of Natural History. If you enjoyed this video, like it and subscribe to our channel. Hit the bell for notifications when we release a new video. Support us on Patreon for early access and exclusive content. You can also follow us on all our social media. Links are found in the description. Thanks for watching and follow your curiosity to new discoveries.